Hi. So far we have considered a DEA approach uh, from a perspective of the mathematical programming formulations and also from the perspective of the production theory. So in this lesson then uh, we will have a look at the DEA from the statistical perspective. So as the DEA became uh, increasingly popular in the 1980s, uh, there was also uh, some critique from the econometricians and statisticians. And uh, in this quotation uh, from uh, Professor Peter Schmidt, who is one of the original developers of the stochastic frontier analysis approach, which we will consider later, uh, Professor Schmidt articulates this uh, critique quite clearly. Uh, I believe that uh, one of the reasons why DEA has been uh, and perhaps continues to be difficult to understand for, for uh, many econometricians is that uh, uh, DEA literature often uses this term model uh, when they are describing the linear programming formulations, which as, such as the ones we considered earlier in the discourse. Uh, however, in the language of uh, econometricians, the model is something else. So model would be something that uh, would be this uh, unknown object of interest, uh, and then, then uh, we are trying to estimate something. So if I translate this um, uh, previous DEA formulations that we have considered to the language of econometricians, then uh, uh, the situation would be looking something like this. So recall from the lesson on production theory, the general definition of the production possibility set, which was indicated by symbol T. And uh, we also introduced uh, several assumptions uh, stated as axioms, some properties of T, such as free disposability and convexity and constant returns to scale. So this uh, definition of production possibility set T and the axioms, this is in fact the model in the terminology of the econometrician. Okay. So then if you think about the linear programming formulations that, uh, that we have considered for, for estimating this, uh, this T, so that would be estimator. So here is, for example, the uh, formula for the DEA estimator for the uh, production possibility set T in the case of constant returns to scale. So these math programming formulations of DEA, which, which operations research literature often refers to as DEA model, in fact, in terminology of econometrician, that would be DEA estimator. And I believe this uh, econometric uh, terminology is, uh, is, uh, is clearer. I, I do not like this uh, habit of uh, operational researchers to call this uh, what are essentially estimators as, as models. So there is, in general, I feel that there's too much use of, uh, of model when, when some other terms such as estimator would be preferable. So what about then, then uh, statistical properties? So there has been a great attention in the, in the DEA literature on uh, statistical consistency of the DEA estimator. And uh, if we phrase it in terms of the uh, production possibility set T, then we can say that the DEA estimator is statistically consistent if this uh, DEA production possibility set, so T superscript DEA CRS, approaches to the true technology T as the sample size N approaches to infinity. So this is the basic uh, definition of uh, statistical consistency if uh, phrased in terms of the production possibility set. But uh, then the question that arises is uh, what kind of data generating process uh, uh, would, uh, would satisfy this kind of, uh, or would ensure this kind of statistical consistency if we apply DEA to our data? What kind of assumptions are needed to have a statistical consistency of the DEA estimator? And uh, in my understanding, this is exactly what uh, Professor Peter Schmidt was criticizing in this previous quotation, that there was a uh, DA was being used, but uh, without really understanding of, uh, of this uh, data generating process, or in fact, what is actually being estimated. So in fact, uh, it's interesting to note that um, this uh, classical uh, uh, paper on efficiency analysis by Michael Farrell already 
presents quite an insightful discussion on this issue that uh, he's writing that uh, if one looks at from the statistical point of view, then uh, one may wish to reformulate the problem such that uh, there exists some efficient function from which all observed data points deviate randomly in the same direction. So there's only one one-sided directions from the frontier, namely inefficiency. And Farrell continues to discuss and he notes that this is an interesting problem for any theoretical statistician but for practical purposes the important fact is that if the errors are small compared to the variation in efficiencies the bias will be negligible so he also considers the possibility of noise so in the DEA literature uh, Perhaps the first serious attempt to address this uh, issue formally came from uh, Professor Rajiv Banker. So Banker is one of the giants in the, in the DEA literature. He's perhaps best known for the uh, contributions to the variable returns to scale DEA technology. But uh, in my, my view, this uh, contribution to the uh, statistical foundation of DEA is uh, at least equally important. So I have here phrased this uh, banker's uh, developments uh, using banker's own, uh, own writing from the management science article in 1993. So uh, banker starts uh, by first uh, defining the T DEA technology. And it's interesting to note that, uh, that um, banker uses here the special case of the single output, uh, uh, single output technology and he phrases everything in terms of the production function. So notice that in the case of single output pro technology, the production function that characterizes the frontier can be stated as, as equation two on this, uh, this slide. Uh, in the next uh, session, I will also briefly discuss the uh, historical developments of uh, axiomatic approach prior to the introduction of DEA. And I will note that uh, Sidney Afriat anticipated this production function already in his 1972 paper. In fact, this is exactly the same kind of piecewise linear production function that Afriat was using in his work. But uh, that's a, another issue that we will discuss later. So this is the uh, DEA frontier stated as the piecewise linear curve, which can be can be uh, stated in this way using the intensity weights lambda. Notice that these intensity weights lambda are the same kind of lambdas that we also used in the previous slides for the characterizing the production possibility set of DEA. So following this uh, Farrell's uh, idea of, of one-sided deviations, Banker then postulates uh, efficiency deviations uh, denoted by epsilon, and he's assuming that this uh, epsilon are independently and identically distributed with certain probability density function f. And uh, he also assumes that the density function is, uh, is monotonic. However, in contrast to the parametric approaches in econometrics, Banker doesn't really specify any specific uh, probability distribution for, the, for this uh, error term. For example, so for the, our purposes, it's, uh, we can think about this epsilon not as the usual kind of error term in, uh, in regression models, but rather it is more like the inefficiency distribution that we will consider the, the later, later in the context of stochastic frontier analysis. So usually in the stochastic frontier analysis, uh, um, it is assumed that the inefficiency has certain specific parametric distribution for example, uh, half normal or exponential. So these usual kind of SFA distributions like half normal inefficiency or exponential inefficiency, they would satisfy this uh, assumption of monotonicity that Banker is assuming. However, here Banker doesn't really need to specify whether the distribution is half normal or exponential or something else. There is just some monotonic density function for the deviation. So then Banker proceeds with these assumptions to formulate the following kind of uh, maximum likelihood estimator. And this is a fully non-parametric estimator in the sense that uh, uh, 
uh, neither the functional form of the frontier, so this function G, nor the density function of the deviations, the density function F, neither of those have any specific parametric uh, functional form. So it is fully non-parametric uh, estimator, and in the objective function uh, labeled as number one, uh, we are essentially maximizing the value of the likelihood function. So in theory, Banker then shows an, uh, as proposition two that if these uh, stated assumptions uh, hold, then in fact uh, the DEA estimator is uh, the optimal solution to this uh, uh, maximum likelihood problem number one. In other words, DEA can be interpreted as a maximum likelihood estimator uh, when, when the frontier production function satisfies the certain assumptions like being monotonic, increasing and concave, and the density function of the deviation is, is uh, monotonic and the errors are, or the deviations are identically and independently distributed. So this is a very strong result in the sense that uh, this kind of non-statistical DEA approach actually does have a very interesting uh, statistical basis as a maximum likelihood estimator and it is a non-parametric maximum likelihood estimator in the sense that we do not need to specify the functional form of the frontier or the, or the inefficiency distribution. Thank you also proceeded to show that, uh, that uh, under the stated assumptions, uh, the DEA estimator is also statistically consistent, meaning that uh, as the sample size approaches to infinity, then the DEA estimator of the production function, so this kind of piecewise linear frontier that DEA is estimating, it will converge towards the, the true frontier, so the true production possibility set. So this consistency result uh, has been later also uh, extended and, uh, and further elaborated in several papers. Uh, here is one example by, by uh, Knight Park and Seymour, uh, where the consistency has been also then extended to the general multiple inputs, multiple outputs case. Another important uh, uh, contribution has been also to prove the rate of convergence for this this uh, DEA estimator. So recall that the, the consistency of the DEA estimator means that uh, as the sample size approaches to infinity, uh, the DEA estimator approaches to the, to the true but unknown frontier. The rate of convergence then states how fast this convergence is taking place. And here is the result uh, proved in this Knight Park and CMAR paper. So they show that this rate of convergence depends on the sample size n, but it also depends on the number of uh, input variables and number of output variables. So those are p and q. Uh, what matters is the, is the total number of input and output variables, p plus q. It does not matter if there is uh, more input variables and output variables. It's just the total amount of variables. So at this point, it's, uh, it, uh, it's useful to compare to the case of parametric uh, approaches, such as uh, usual linear regression. So in the linear regression analysis, the, the rate of convergence would be of order n to power minus one half. So if you look at this uh, formula on this slide and you see that uh, for the DEA, this uh, rate of convergence uh, is of order n to power minus two divided by p plus q plus one. So uh, if there are three variables, p plus q is three, then this rate of convergence would be the same as that of the, the usual uh, parametric approaches like linear regression. But when the number of input and output uh, outputs increases, then this rate of convergence starts to slow down. And uh, this is the what the stati in statistics is known as phenomenon as the curse of dimensionality. Uh, on the slide, I refer to, uh, to Stone's 1980 results of the optimal rate of convergence so for non-parametric estimators. So similar kind of rate curse of dimensionality also occurs in other type of non-parametric methods like, uh, like kernel regression or local linear kernel. 
for example. So this is an important uh, practical lesson in the sense that it might be tempting to include uh, many, many input and output variables in order to better capture the heterogeneity of the, of the units and uh, their operating environments. But uh, from the statistical point of view, this is not really a good idea because uh, then this kind of ap approximation of, uh, of DEA suffers from that uh, severely and uh, particularly the rate of convergence. Uh, this rate of convergence result can be also thought of in the other way that we can think of how large sample size would be needed if we have many, many inputs and outputs. So in practice, to have reasonable accuracy, you would need to have really astronomically large sample size to, to be able to model uh, some dozens of inputs and outputs. So in practice, uh, uh, practical application of DEA, it should be meaningful to, to restrict the number of inputs and outputs in, in one way or another to, to reasonably small number. For example, we might, uh, might use some uh, uh, cost aggregates from the input side or revenue aggregates on the output side to, to reduce the uh, dimensionality. So one important uh, development in the, in the statistical uh, direction in DEA has been the introduction of uh, hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, and other type of, uh, of um, statistical inferences. And uh, on this slide, I have uh, briefly sketched the bootstrapping approach uh, by Leopold Seymour and Paul Wilson in, uh, in their uh, several, several papers. Uh, so the basic idea in the in the bootstrap is that uh, that we try to mimic the the data generating process that uh, that generated our original sample. So uh, um, I briefly go through the, the through the steps to to give you some intuition. So in the first step, we just apply DEA to obtain the efficiency score. So this theta would uh, would refer to in this case to the output output oriented efficiency scores. So in the second step, we then apply some non-parametric estimator, for example, kernel density estimator, to estimate the probability distribution of the, of the true but unknown efficiency. Recall from this Banker's paper that Banker assumed also this density function f for the deviations from the frontier. So in the bootstrapping, there's similarly, we need to have a density, but rather than assume some kind of parametric density function, in the works by Simmer and Wilson, they apply kernel density estimator to estimate this density function empirically from data. Okay, so then the next thing is to is to draw some uh, so-called pseudo inefficiencies from this uh, from this uh, estimated probability distribution of the of the of the uh, inefficiency term or the deviations. And in step four, we then use this, uh, these pseudo efficiencies, but also those original e efficiencies to form so-called uh, pseudo sample from our observed data. So uh, the idea with these steps uh, three, four uh, is in some sense to draw a random sample from our estimated DEA frontier and uh, and uh, mimic the data generating process in the sense that, okay, if our, our DEA frontier was actually the true technology and we draw some random sample from this DEA frontier and apply again DEA to this, our, our thus obtained uh, pseudo samples, then how well can our DEA estimator capture this uh, uh, true frontier? So this is then done in step five. So having these pseudo samples, we apply again DEA to those uh, to those uh, pseudo samples to, to get this kind of um, impression of our efficiency, and then we can compare that how well did we actually actually capture this uh, efficiency? Because now when we when we randomly drew this uh, pseudo efficiencies eta, we we know what is the true efficiency, so we can compare the the DEA estimator the performance on 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 these. Uh, what we actually drew from this uh, kernel density. Okay, and the idea with the bootstrap is to then 
uh, replicate this simulation many, many times, maybe maybe 2,000 times to get some idea of the of the probability distribution. We can use it to get some information about the finite sample bias of the DEA estimator. We can also use it to for bias correction, but also we can make them some statistical tests when conference the conference conf confidence intervals uh, for our efficiency estimates. So this opens up a door for for truly probabilistic inferences using the DEA approach. So there are a couple of points I want to want to note. Of course, this uh, contribution of uh, of Simar and Wilson on the development of bootstrap is, is really uh, undeniable. However, it's it's wrong to say that uh, they were the first uh, to develop the bootstrap. Uh, in fact, there were several previous proposals to apply bootstrap in DEA. And uh, this is some uh, some text from the from the papers by Simar and Wilson where they actually cite Ferrier and Hirschberg uh, and also the Swedish authors uh, Lothgren and Tambour, which already published several papers uh, proposing the uh, proposing the application of bootstrap for for statistical inferences in DEA. However, the Simar and Wilson criticized quite heavily these previous approaches. Uh, uh, and using the term naive bootstrap, and the critical step why I, I highlighted this uh, this uh, kernel density estimator on the previous slide, or even using the red color, is that uh, this uh, use of the of the some consistent non-parametric estimator of the probability density function is really critical for the statistical consistency of the of the uh, of the bootstrap uh, approach. So uh, I believe Simar and Wilson were the first to formally show that their, their statistical, uh, sorry, that their bootstrap procedure is statistically consistent. Uh, there has been also some some debate about the, the statistical inferences to, to what is better, the, the Simar and Wilson's bootstrap approach or or Banker's uh, uh, earlier approach using. Um, parametric inferences. So already this uh, 1993 paper of Rajiv Banker proposed to test hypotheses using DEA building on the parametric assumption that uh, that this uh, density function f that he used, that if the f is uh, if uh, has the exponential distribution or perhaps half normal distribution, then Banker shows how that how, how it's possible to apply DEA for testing hypotheses. The main advantage of uh, this bootstrap uh, procedure uh, developed by Seymour and Wilson is that uh, you do not need to have these parametric distributional assumptions. So it allows the data speak for themselves as far as the inefficiency distribution is concerned. However, it's often claimed that uh, that uh, Banker's uh, procedure is only valid asymptotically, whereas uh, Seymour and Wilson's uh, uh, is somehow more appropriate for finite samples. In fact, also, also, if you read uh, carefully Simar and Wilson's papers, they also note that uh, that um, bootstrap uh, uh, is asymptotically uh, as asymptotic procedure. So the so the approximation becomes exact only as the sample size approaches to infinity. So there is not really uh, major difference in that respect. The difference is about the, the parametric assumptions about the inefficiency distribution. Finally, I want to also also correct one uh, surprisingly common misconception about the bootstrap and noise. So, uh, surprisingly, many people have the impression that uh, bootstrap would somehow make DEA more robust to noise, or 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 even take into account noise in this uh, in these uh, confidence intervals or hypothesis test. So, if you read the works by by Simar and Wilson more carefully, they also Openly recognize that uh, that um, um, a larger remaining challenge is to find a way for allowing stochastic noise in the data. So the bootstrap and other statistical inferences in DEA uh, rely on this assumption of one-sided deviations. So basically, all of deviations are due to inefficiency. There is not any any random noise. 
This also results in practice that uh, the confidence intervals for, for DEA obtained by bootstrap are very tight, which I find sometimes can be, can be misleading for the decision makers who are not uh, aware of this issue that noise is still assumed away. And further, if in fact the data are uh, perturbed by noise, then if we apply bootstrap to have a bias correction, then that can actually uh, make things worse because a bootstrap would only boost the impact of noise. And I believe this is also a point that has not been fully, fully appreciated yet. So uh, if we have noisy data, then uh, especially the bias correction, correction by bootstrap is really bad idea. So we will continue to the, to the statistical approaches like, like stochastic frontier analysis and stoned uh, in the later lectures, but uh, we will have one more lecture on uh, history of DEA, particularly from the economic perspective and prior to the classical approach of uh, Chance, Cooper and Rhodes.